I'm at Luella Park. And Luella Park is uh, in Chicago. It is uh, off 101st Street and Jeffries, so well, in that area. And this is where the Richard Speck crime happened back in 1966. I met Luella Park because it was here, it was here that Richard Speck was hanging out just before he committed the murder of eight nurses. Well, they were students to become nurses. They were three weeks away from graduation. Richard Speck uh, was a really bad guy. He really never amounted to anything. He was weird in grade school. He got into drugs. He got into uh, alcohol, petty crime. He carried a, uh, he was very proud to carry a huge switchblade, uh, bigger than most, and he knew how to use it. In fact, he knew how to, became an expert at prying windows out and burglarizing. This is really amazing. I had no idea there was such dramatic uh, work here at Mount Carmel. J. Sal Salerno. John Salerno. John Salerno was a pilot, perhaps in World War I. That looks like World War I garb. John Salerno, born March 27th, 1899, died July 7th, 1926. 27 years old there. Not lost, blessed, thought, comma, but gone before where we shall meet to part no more, your beloved wife. That's, that's beautiful. We're walking over now to Suzanne Bridget Ferris's grave, buried with the father, her father and mother. Um, the Ferris family w was from the south side, southwest side, and they did not come from a lot of money. Their, their house there was a beautiful little home. Uh, the son had his own room. Two girls shared a room, and, and the parents slept in a, uh, a pull-out, uh, one of those pull-out beds in the living room. And uh, but you know what? It's all about family and love, and there was a lot of it in that family. And uh, Suzanne's father called her Cookie. That was, uh, and there was a cookie jar in the kitchen that is now in the hands of uh, the niece that was uh, something that Suzanne loved and uh, she got that nickname from her father. And uh, Suzanne is here, right here. John, 1907. He lived uh, till 1970, which is four years after the murders, and his wife lived 10 years after the murder of Suzanne. Very sad, very sad. You can imagine the pain that they lived with. I know I read uh, a story from the brother. He still lives with a lot of pain, but good memories. Uh, Suzanne was uh, one of the first her along with one other was, uh, they were the first killed. Uh, Suzanne was one of the, was one of the two girls that surprised Richard Speck while he had the other one on the floor the, as it all started unfolding. So, um, hopefully, uh, John and Mary and their daughter Suzanne resting in peace.
He ended up in this area because his family from moving to Dallas, uh, from originally from Kirksville, Illinois, he couldn't make it, so he came here because his sister lived here. And he, uh, you know, he was just shacking up and slumming off her. And uh, finally she kicked him out. She said, you gotta get a job. And he lost his job with the, uh, he was a merchant shipman, and he lost his job there, of course. He pulled the knife on his superior, that about did it. And then he was here in this area at the hall where they were, where they hand out the jobs. And he, his sister came and, you know, he's like, I've got nothing, I've got nothing left. She came here and she gave him $25. And instead of using the money wisely, he immediately took the money and left the uh, place of uh, the union place where they hire people and started hitting the bars. Marianne Jordan. Well, Marianne was Irish, Irish Catholic. She grew up uh, in a family of six. It was a devout family. They lived on the west side, southwest side, I think in Darien, Illinois. She uh, took particular interest in her little brother, Billy who was uh, the youngest. Billy was born with Down syndrome. And uh, this partially inspired Marianne to become a nurse. Uh, really, it started with her. Her dad would tell her stories of her grandmother, who was the head surgical nurse, or one of the heads at the University of Michigan. And I guess she did some amazing things there. So she was a legend in the family and Marianne with the fact that uh, those stories and that her little brother she'd take care of, she, she really wanted to help people. She really wanted to, she wanted to become a nurse. And so she also loved swimming she loved badminton, she loved roller skating, she loved ice skating, she loved softball, she loved, she loved all the things that typical kids love growing up. But also taking a lot of responsibility for a younger brother and sister, not only Billy, but her younger sister by five years, Susan. She would walk Susan to uh, she walked her on her first day of kindergarten by herself when she was five years old. Of course, the parents were working hard and lots of, responsi lots of responsibilities with the family. A lot of good times. Uh, she was doing really well and uh, her brother, Phil, was uh, engaged to uh, Suzanne Ferris. Suzanne, we were, we started out with Suzanne at her grave. Suzanne and Marianne had the, un well, they were all unfortunate, but they were um, probably among the first to be uh, killed by Richard Speck because Mary Ann was not supposed to be there. It was just circumstance. She had moved out of that, uh, those apartments, those bungalows, uh, those dorms. I'm not sure what you call, were, they were called then, but uh, they were probably best described as group apartments for the students. And she was living at home, but her brother Phil came by the night uh, that evening of July 13th 
And his fiance uh, was one of her best friends, Suzanne Ferris. And uh, they came over and they said, hey, uh, well, Suzanne said to Marianne, come on over. Let's, uh, let's talk about the wedding plans with, uh, you know, I'm having, I'm making with your brother and uh, brother Phil. And so Phil and Marianne and Suzanne jumped in the car and they headed to uh, the apartment. And I think it was one in the morning, 1230 or one in the morning, something like that. Um, Phil dropped him off. Can you imagine looking back on it? And they walked in the hallway and they walked right into the hands of the murderer. And it was just uh, really, really unfortunate. I mean, Marianne, it's one of those, it's one of those things of circumstance. You just, you just can't predict it. And it just, uh, the things lined up and Marianne was there, so. Their grave is around here. Oh, I see it right over here. Uh, the Jordan Monument is right here. I see uh, Philip and Patricia here. And this is uh, 1938. Philip died in December 4th, 2002, and Patricia. So this is Philip's grave. This is the brother Philip, um, who I believe was a veteran, yes. Uh, he was in the Coast Guard. Yeah, he, does, he died in 2002. Can you imagine how he felt? I mean, you can't, there's no blame here. But could you imagine? Uh, he must have replayed it 10,000 times over his lifetime that, you know, I dropped them off at 1 in the morning. What if I didn't? What if this? What if that? Just imagine what he went through before he passed away. Um... Mary Ann's over here. She's with her parents and she's with Billy. Yep. So let's see here. We've got Philip the father, 1909 to 1974. Six years after the incident. Not just an incident. Uh, Mary. 1909 to 1982. Billy was born in 1955, died in 96, and Marianne, there she is, died in 1966. It's really July 4th, well, no one will know, it was between uh, the midnight hours, the morning hours. July 13th uh, to July 14th in the morning. Um, it was really sad because I, I understand that Billy said, he only spoke two words at a time, he had Down syndrome. But when that happened, he said, Mary Ann is dead. Mary Ann is dead. Those are the most words I guess he, he ever spoke. Um, let's see here. Ah, uh, this is Philip, uh, senior. And this basically shows that he was, uh, Knights of Columbus, which is a Catholic, um, it's a Catholic group that promotes Catholicism and, you know, supports all the people in the Catholic faith, along with a lot of charities, great group. So here rests Marianne, 
Hopefully you're resting in peace with your family, and Billy and your parents, and your, your brother Philip. Hopefully you're all resting in peace here. And started hitting the bars. And he followed a, a middle-aged woman from bar to bar the day the day before the day it, the day it happened and he ended up pulling the knife on her and bringing her back to his he he had gotten a room at, at some really cheap flop house here and he ended up bringing uh bringing her there by at knife point and raping her and in her purse she had a 22 uh handgun he stole that, of course, out of her purse, and then uh, ended up here at this park at, at dark. Nina Jo Schmale. Nina Jo was one of the nurses that lost her life that fateful night in July. We're at uh, Wheaton Cemetery in Wheaton, Illinois. And uh, not far from here is where the Schmale family had a farm. That's where uh, Nina Jo grew up with her brother, John. And it was a simple life. It was a simple life. They had a lot of land. I think it was a uh, it was a, a, a farm through the generations. They were German by descent, and they still had some land left. And they, uh, Nina and her brother John went to the uh, the one the one room schoolhouse that you read about and hear about the storybook, kind of a storybook picture. And they would bring their their lunch in in tin buckets. Yuri Stelmach. Yuri died in 06. John being the older brother. I'm sure he had an influence on Nina. Um, he was studying to be a doctor, so she, in the back of her mind, always wanted to be, uh, had that inkling of being a nurse. And, but she, when she graduated from Glenbard here, you know, the choices were few in those days, the 50s, the 60s. For women, unfortunately, you could be a you could be a secretary. You could be, a, as they called them in those days, a stewardess, which was a hard job to get, flight attendant, and uh, you could you could be a a teacher, or you could be a nurse. But Nina started out as a secretary, and after a couple of years of that she uh, you know she had been a caregiver at this uh, when she was younger she would bring Christmas Christmas gifts to this uh, it was an elder care facility called the poor farm so it was always in her DNA to do this and beloved daughter and niece Jennifer Sue Brody. It was always in uh, Nina's DNA. So when she was 19, she said, Mom, Dad, family, I'm going to be a nurse. And that's how that got her, that's how she got started. Nina was uh, kind of, she was pretty quiet but she had a dry sense of humor. 
and she loved the color pink and Elvis. She was a big Elvis fan. This is Brian Vogel. Brian died three years ago, 2017. And you can see here, he has not forgotten. He has not forgotten. I'm sure his kids, if he has kids, his wife, family. So when Nina got connected with the rest of the women and she she had all she had said I you know I, I was three or four years older I felt like I was over the hill with this group and but they loved her and they really loved her because she had this 1957 Chevy uh, I think it was a Bel Air I know it was yellow, colonial cream, I think was the color. And they, they were in that, it was a convertible. Um, and there is a picture of her fiance or boyfriend at the time, but fiance uh, cleaning uh, the, the tires, cleaning the car with, you know, if you look at us, you know, I, you look closely He's got the old hose with his finger in the hose. And he is, uh, he's cleaning that car. I mean, it's, it's like a time machine when you see these pictures. And speaking of these pictures, and by the way, her, their, that, that Chevy was bought by dad and dad could barely afford it, but dad drove a beat up pickup truck. So, you know, Nina was everything. So speaking of pictures, so John, this is recently, her brother John goes down in the basement. There's a flood, you know, here in Chicago, we get a lot of these floods, a lot of terrible weather. <laughs> and lo and behold, he finds a box somehow and it's not destroyed, but it's pretty damaged. It's moldy and wet. And there in the box, he sees his mom's handwriting and he starts thumbing through it, digging. And lo and behold, he sees slides. And these slides are from 1960. So I'm going to tell you about that. Now, I've, this is interesting. So let's, let's see Christine here. Uh, Christine Rene Challenger Salella. I don't know if there's a story here, but she was born in 62 and died in 2014. So, died too young as many. But what's interesting here is there is a big worn out piece of dirt, which means a lot of people are coming here paying their respects to Christine. The only other time I've seen this recently is at Al Capone, not, and there's no comparison, but Al Capone's grave where a whole bunch of people come. And I see there are flowers here, so we'll see what we can find out about Christine. Anyway, back to the story. John pulls the pictures out and Lo and behold, he starts holding them up, you know, he's in the basement and holds the, uh, look at that, isn't that beautiful? Right when I walked under that. Isn't that interesting? Right when I walked under it. And now it stops. He finds these pictures and he's looking up in the basement light in the ceiling through these slides and he immediately sees his sister and these this is like a time machine this is a complete throwback 
to 1966, right before this uh, happened. Gets out the slide projector. He starts going through them, and you can just imagine the emotion that was going on as picture after picture was yielding of images of most of the girls just before it happened. This was uh, a priceless find. Priceless. And fast forward, and the next thing you know, the media, Chicago Tribune, WGN, radio, it's all over. And what's nice is now the story, more of the story of the nurses can be told and not the story of the murderer, the devil. Focus on the nurses. So I liked seeing that. That's partially what inspired me to do this. And if you get bored with the stories and the cemetery, the story of the nurses, then move on. But this, this, this is about the nurses. And Anyway, beautiful images and a beautiful family. Uh, this here is the marker for the family right here. And here are the graves of John and Dorothy, the mother and the father, and the older stone from 1966. Mom died five years later in 1971, and Dad died in 1988. to the family. Hopefully you uh, are resting in peace.